So hello and welcome to the Region 3 Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center uh, anti-racism podcast series entitled The 20-Minute Talk. The Region 3 Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center, which I'll refer to moving forward as a MAP Center, our anti-racism podcast series aims to advance anti-racist efforts and support anti-racist activity within school communities across and beyond the MAP Center's 13 state region with a succinct 20 minute discussion led by anti-racist practitioners. Thanks, Tiffany. This anti-racism podcast episode is focused on hope, healing and harmony for anti-racism. Specifically, we'll be talking today about how we define harmony and who gets to define harmony as well as the cost of unity for historically and systemically marginalized people. So we are thrilled to have this final episode of our first season of the Anti-Racism Vodcast series. As you all now may be very well aware, but some of you may be new to the Vodcast series. My name is Tiffany Kaiser, and I serve as the Associate Director of Engagement and Partnerships for the MAP Center. And I have the distinct privilege of serving as a co-host along with Nikki Coomer, who's a doctoral research assistant with the MAP Center. We are also thrilled to have three guests with us here today to lead our conversation. So joined with us are Dr. Chrishella Warden sutton who is the Director of Family and Community Engagement for Racine Unified School District, as well as an Assistant Professor of Education at Concordia University in Wisconsin. We also have with us Courtney Reed Jenkins, who is the Assistant Director of Special Education for the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. And finally, Dr. Rev Hillstrom, the Director of Equi Education Equity for Osseo Area Schools in Minnesota. Thank you all so much for being with us today. So I want to I want to jump right in because I know this is going to be a rich conversation and want to ask Chris Arella to kick us off with the first reflective prompt of how do you define hope, healing and harmony within the context of pursuing racial justice in schools. So we'll have Chris Arella kick us off and then uh, Rev and Courtney uh, to extend any thoughts. Thank you, Tiffany. And I, I think it's important for me to say that I enter this conversation with the perspective and the narrative of a uh, female of African descent, um, you know, a black mm -hmm. child who was educated in public schools, mm -hmm. whose parents were college educated, who were college educated um, at historically black colleges. Um, and, um, you know, and then when I think about the ancestral connection um, just, you know, as it relates to hope, healing, and, and harmony, it's important for me to, to really interject them into this conversation, um, because all of those perspectives, their hopes and dreams influences um, how I view these concepts um, and try to digest them, because they, they have some ambiguity, um, depending upon your perspective and your narrative. So, we know the basic definition of hope. And when we think about the historical context that goes along with hope, healing, and harmony, you know, hope looks different depending upon your narrative and your experience and your racial um, autobiography around this. So, you know, hope, you know, this desire to always want something, you know, to want something for, because you see a promise at the other end. Um, the healing suggests some level of restoration and, um, you know, harmony, you know, this piece of working together, living in peace. So again, when I think about my life conditioning around understanding these terms and my experiences, um, what strikes me is I have to lean on Ruby Bridges in 1960 at six years old and what that looked like for her to be six and just want to be educated. And the trauma that surrounded her just to exercise that right of being educated. Um, as I began to even read Kendi's work, you know, how to um, be an anti-racist, you know, on the inside cover, you know, the, the quote, um, the only way to undo racism is to consistently identify, describe it, and dismantle And that's the way that you can begin to dismantle it. So I, you know, those terms, um, I really struggled with that, you know, in preparation for this conversation, because 
of, I think there's promise. I do believe there's a level of healing. I do think that there can be harmony, but for whom? I want to open it up to um, Courtney and Rev, if you have um, any responses to that or anything to build. And then also, as we segue, Courtney, to the second prompt um, that you're going to kind of lead us with sort of wrestling with some ideas and, and your thoughts around this idea is the, pers is the pursuit of hope healing and harmony for anti-racist school communities, different pending one's race. So want to have space to, Courtney, for you and Rev to respond or build on anything Chris Rilla said. And then Courtney, you can lead us through the, the second prompt. Chris Rilla, I want to thank you for your story and for you, your humanity. Um, seeing you in some of those other map center conversations and I was like, oh, that's a person to be reckoned with. And it's clear that's true. So thank you for, for giving to me today. Thank you. Um, I, I was left with when I heard you talking about harmony for who. And, and as a lifetime musician, I, I went to the metaphor of harmony. And I'm wondering if you want to maybe expound on this or even add some thoughts. But harmony is something that's added to a melody historically. And I'm wondering who's singing the melody and, and, and who's got to harmonize it. And it still feels like so often that this harmonization is this, this still applying ourselves to somebody else's melody. And I'm wondering when your melody, when your story, my story and others get to be the melody and what that would look like and how it might lead to some of the hope and, and the healing that we're talking about. What would it look like for a different melody to be sang instead of me always harmonizing? And one thing I do know as a musician, it's really hard to harmonize with somebody who's on a key or, or <laughs> not, you know, not on pitch. <laughs> so I'm just curious if you had any thoughts around that. I think um, what comes to mind is, you know, this phrasing of um, moving to the beat of your drummer, <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, when I think, and I don't, not too deep into this, but even, um, you know, we think when I think about um, African ancestry and, the, you know, with the drums, you know, the calling of the drums and how those beats connect, you know, there's some level of spiritual connection that comes from that, that helps to sustain one um, to gravitate towards that, you know, that sense of um, it's going to be okay regardless of what is going to be okay. Uh, and, and, um, and I think even though others may not hear, you know, or, or tune into it, there still has to be a level of, you know, that, that melody still helps folks to continue to um, march on. You, you think about the civil rights movement, you think about, you know, I think about Fannie Lou Hamer and, and just, the egregious things that were done to her, she had to have some level of, um, you know, that there was there was a drummer. You know, she had her own drum beat, but she also was mirroring that beat with the people that she served. If that makes sense. Courtney, I'll again sort of turn it over to you to, to continue this conversation through this idea of how we pursue as education practitioners, as, as um, stakeholders in school communities, as parents uh, and caregivers within school communities of this idea of pursuing hope, healing and harmony. And is the pursuit of that, of, of um, hope, healing and harmony towards and for anti-racism in anti-racist school communities, um, different pending one's race. So this idea of um, positionality, perhaps, or racial identity as we begin the pursuit. Again, Courtney will kick us off and then uh, Chris Reller, Rev, anything you wanna build onto that. When I was reflecting on this question, I looked at the question in the context of the overall title of the series of these podcasts, which is Reclaim, Revitalize, Reimagine, and Recommit. And when I and when I was reflecting on those words, I was thinking about 
the June Jordan poem that included We Are the Ones We've Been Waiting For, which was picked up by Sweet Honey in the Rock and Alice Walker, Barack Obama, and then more recently in Amanda Gorman's inauguration poem, which is we, um, there's always light if only we're bright enough to be it. And I think about the question around in the pursuit of hope, healing and harmony for anti-racist school communities, is it different pending on one's race? And I would say the short answer is, is yes. So I'll speak specifically to what I feel called to do as a white educational equity leader and frame it around three specific ideas. One, my role as a white leader in dismantling white supremacy. Number two, my role as a white leader in centering and empowering the voices of people of color to define hope, healing, and harmony. And then thirdly, my responsibility as a white educational leader for my white colleagues and their growth. And when I'll start with the ideas around dismantling white supremacy, and for that, the place I lean most heavily on when I think about that is Timo Kunzork, um, and she relied, she articulated in an article in, entitled White Supremacy Culture, some of the characteristics of white supremacy culture that show up in our organizations. And because they function as norms and behaviors, it creates two things. It creates a very strong sense of who belongs and who doesn't belong. And because these are often unspoken norms and cult norms and values, it creates um, a culture that very actively pushes out folks of color and operates as a barrier. And so the characteristics that Tima shared in her article were things like perfectionism, sense of urgency, quantity over quality, defensiveness, worship of the written word, only one way, either or thinking, fear of open conflict, individualism, objectivity, and who has the right to be comforted in conversation and in conflict. And in the article, Tima offers what she calls antidotes or ways to interrupt or ways to reframe those characteristics so that the ways we operate or organize as an organization are better matched with our explicit values around equity and justice. And so I wanted to share very specifically some of the ways that I'm practicing how to disrupt white supremacy in my space, which is at the state education agency. And I wanna offer three examples. The first is an invitation or offer to dissent in real time and not in meetings after the meeting. So one of the ways that I see Midwest NICE play out in uh, our educational agencies is that very rarely will dissent happen within an actual meeting, but happen in a meeting after the meeting where decisions then get made. And so moving that space to the actual space of decision-making within the meeting by holding time on the agenda for active dissent and for actively establishing how we'll solve the decision without a meeting after the meeting. The second example that I wanna share is that I believe it's fully within my power whenever I get an invitation to lead or to work on something that I would call juicy or exciting or a, chall a challenging growth stretch assignment that I have full responsibility and I have full power to invite other folks to lead with that around me, to lead in that effort with me without asking. So as a white person, um, if I'm asked to do a presentation at an 
um, a conference, I may, I, and I'm the only white person, and I notice that, then I will co-present with someone, I'll share my time, but not necessarily check back with someone. So I'm disrupting the uh, power hoarding structures that often exist within an organization. And then finally, I'm working, practicing on decentering the value or importance of the written word by calling in spoken word, by calling in stories. So for example, the way I started today, for example, even when I have to do a written memo, which is sort of our protocol within the state agency, I'll start with a quote from a parent in the community that talks about uh, why we need to be moving forward with it and focusing on anti-racism or a picture. So pushing the boundaries of what is expected in small ways it are ways of dismantling white supremacy. And to conclude this, I'll say that when I use the words I'm currently practicing, this is a practice. So it means that there's a regular personal reflection on how I'm reinforcing white supremacy at DPI, that I'm identifying places where I need to grow and then I commit to that growth through um, practicing and holding myself accountable. Sure. Well, Courtney, I, I definitely appreciate it hearing the the strategies and the bold approach, <laughs> if I may, that you're taking to really recognize as a leader in a very bureaucratic you know, setting um, to begin to dismantle some of that. Because I think um, you know, as a state agency, I always viewed that, that that was the model that does spill into our school districts, you know, to be able to build those structures themselves um, because it's greatly needed because a lot of the decisions that are made um, are made without that compass of, um, you know, we're going to make these decisions for those people. We'll do this and we do that, but not um, looking around and and um, and, rec and and bringing in the, the voices of those um, so they can have so, so that very perspective is there. This is always something that you haven't thought of, and um, raising the awareness of those um, who definitely serve in those roles. That this is a way that you can begin to be more proactive in your um, in your equity journey to begin to ch change a lot of that. Because I know the will is there, but usually it takes um, you know a bold step you know, really stepping out, you know, as I say, stepping out on faith to say, this is just what, how, I, this is, this is the way I think we, we do need to do business. If we're going to have some, um, if we're going to challenge those deficit ways that we have been operating. So. All right, Rev, I'll um, ask you if, as we move to our final prompt and close out um, this particular episode of the podcast, of how you think about this tension between those that are historically marginalized being positioned to sort of temper um, their um, justifiable rage towards racial justice in the name of, of what some would call harmony or unity. Um, and what, I'm just interested in your thoughts uh, on the ideals of what unity versus racial equity or racial justice uh, is for you and in your particular school community context? Well, I, I want to thank the, the learning that I've gotten from my, my colleagues on this call already and just the, it was, it was time well spent. Thank you for the medicine, mm -hmm. the, the energy, the, just the wisdom that each of you have provided me. Mm -hmm. And it's changing my thoughts as I'm, as I'm getting ready to speak here about this. But you, you use the term often um, in that, that question, if you will, uh, Tiffany. And I will say it's never often, it's always. And, and I rarely use absolute words. I don't know, I, I've not lived an experience where as marginalized people, whether they're indigenous or people of color or of uh, the LGBTQ community or, or whatever scenario, able-bodied, linguistic, I don't know of a time where, where people who are facing injustice aren't asked to temper. Right? They're, 
their experience. Um, I don't know that I, it's often asked to temper for the purpose of creating some form of harmony. But I think often it's, it's asked to be tempered because of um, just honestly control. Uh, and when I put that in context though, so as an American Indian and a person who's of both indigenous and European descent, I can never remember a time where indigenous people are centered in the conversation around equity. I, I just don't know that, that as a system, I've experienced that where holistically that's true. There's moments, of course, but the idea of temporarying these things, um, I think really has a lot to do with this idea that we've heard about around fragility and, and how other people can interact with it. But I want to really say this about this work. Individual work is very different than systems work. And um, I've been given the three C's of change as, as a tool. And what I've learned in system changes, C1 is consciousness, C2 is conviction, and C3 is commitment. I can't take my consciousness and make it your commitment. That's not doable. We have to work through solidarity, regardless of fragility or marginalization, to create a collective consciousness, if we're going to change the system. That consciousness has to grow, and then once that consciousness has been developed, then we have to ask ourselves as an individual where our moral imperatives land and where our convictions are. And as those convictions move and change, then we're able to make commitments that create change. So I'm not interested in tempering the work for the purpose of marginalizing groups further and silencing their voice. But I am very interested in measuring the level of consciousness, moving the level of conviction, so new commitments can be made in solidarity. Uh, the, the communities are fractured if for no other reason that colonialism has been the foundation of this country and those behaviors have been perpetuated throughout, right? And so that isn't going to change till solidarity comes about. Yeah, the only thing I'll add before um, Nikki transitions to close us out is, you know, positioning solidarity as um, as the focus, because in the pursuit of anti-racism at the intersection of other forms of oppression buoyed by dominant ideologies, um, we want to get to accomplish it and solidarity. So uh, I echo Chris Arella and Courtney's sentiments that pushing us to um, move toward solidarity requires us to take up the work necessary to realize solidarity. Um, and so I appreciate it, even just the positioning of solidarity as a unapologetic um, direction that we all must move. Um, and it also, I think, pursuing solidarity for me personally, as someone who possesses multiple historically marginalized identities, but also um, identities where I am privileged, such as being temporarily abled, um, allows me to extend and um, open up my learning in different types of ways where I need to concentrate on growing and learning and decentering in ways that I can decenter um, where I have more privileged identities and what does that mean to pursue solidarity in those spaces versus the other areas where I've been historically marginalized. And I think that creates, at least for me in my personal journey, a more robust trajectory that I must continue to commit to, but it also equips me in my role professionally to, I think, understand, recognize, value, and hopefully um, serve in a leadership role that is much more comprehensive and or maybe not cogent, but comprehensive in considering the ways in which we all show up in this beautiful experience differently and the ways in which because of intersectionality, some of us, our work is different than as Courtney noted, the work if you have more dominant identity. So not conflating that the work is the same, that it's universal because it is not emphatically, right? But that 
we all have a very nuanced journey uh, to understand how we get to solidarity, but we all must get to solidarity. I really appreciate it. We have new products on our website as of this recording. Our weekly five-minute podcast series, That's All Folks, is now published on our website at www.greatlakesequity.org. We have a second podcast available this week as well, published by one of our esteemed equity fellows, Dr. Tara Vincent Chambers, um, who has coined the phrase racial opportunity costs. In this podcast, she is talking with a panel of professors, parents, and students to discuss their experience with racial opportunity costs, particularly in relation to the Black Lives Matter movement. And last but not least, we have a newsletter written by graduate assistant Tamara Moore and edited by graduate assistant Aaron Sanborn entitled Commit to Recommit, Making Equity Work Personal, in which they explore the need for educators to reflect on the personal impact of systemic inequity on students and reestablishing the need for transformative change. And if you are on social media, if you're on Facebook or Twitter, be sure to find us and follow us. You can find us on Facebook at the Great Lakes Equity Center slash Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center and on Twitter at Great Lakes EAC. Um, if you would, please share with us what you learned today and don't forget to hashtag map equity. Thank you, Nikki. And again, I want to thank our special guests for their time, for their perspectives, for their insights. Uh, we deeply appreciate each of you. And um, I just want to, on behalf of the MAP Center, say thank you. Thank you. So with that, we'll see everyone next time. This resource was brought to you by the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center. To find out about other Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center resources, visit our website at www.greatlakesequity.org. To subscribe to our publications, click on the subscribe to our publications link located on the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center website. The Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center, a project of the Great Lakes Equity Center, is funded by the United States Department of Education to provide technical assistance, resources, and professional learning opportunities related to equity, civil rights, and systemic school reform throughout our 13-state region. The contents of this presentation were developed under a grant from the U.S. Department of Education. However, these contents do not necessarily represent the policy of the U.S. Department of Education, and you should not assume endorsement by the federal government. This product and its contents are provided to educators, local and state education agencies, and or non-commercial entities for educational training purposes only. No part of this recording may be reproduced or utilized in any form or in any means, electronic or mechanical, including recording or by any information storage and retrieval system without permission in writing from the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center. Finally, the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center would like to thank the Indiana University School of Education Indianapolis at IUPY, as well as Executive Director Dr. Kathleen Kintorius, Director of Operations Dr. Sina Skelton, and Associate Director Dr. Tiffany Kaiser for their leadership and guidance in the development of all tools and resources to support the region.